Welcome to Lesson 26 of Learn um, Bible Greek. We're, this is the third of three lessons looking at the words of Jesus to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And uh, we'll, we'll finish the series of three with this uh, lesson, Lesson 26. Apekrithi Nicodemus kai penato pos dunatai tauta genesai. So answered Nicodemus and said to him, in English we probably just say uh, Nicodemus answered, or really Nicodemus asked, since it's a question, post dunatai tauta genesai. The semicolon here indicates a question mark, which is not used in our Greek manuscripts. We use a semicolon instead for a question mark. How can these things be? Verse 10, Apekrithi Jesus kai epen auto. Notice exactly the same um, words here. Uh, Jesus answered him, Su e hodidaskelos to Israel kai tauta ukenoskes. You are the teacher of Israel, and these things not you know. Um, some English versions say a teacher and some say the teacher, which uh, might seem surprising. Well, the rules for when to use the and when not to use it are surprisingly complex in both English and Greek, and they're different in each language. They don't totally overlap, so it's impossible really to know for sure if uh, he meant the teacher, in other words, the top guy or just one of them. So the English versions I consulted, um, there was some on each side, well the most of the commentators that I looked at said um, the, in terms of the top man, the top teacher of Israel, and you don't know these things? Amen, amen. Lego soy. So again, we have this Amen, Amen. I say to you, Hoti, that Ho oidamen, lalomen, kai ho eurakamen, marturomen. What we know, we are speaking of, and what we have seen, we bear witness to. It's interesting that Jesus um, uses the word we. Um, the first person plural, and so the commentators debate what did he mean? Did he mean him and the father, or is it just like the royal plural, like the king or the queen says, we think this or we think that, the royal plural? Um, or uh, Jesus and the father, or Jesus and the spirit, uh, the trinity? Or does it mean Jesus and his men, his apostles? So all those are possibilities, but um, I think this is the only place where Jesus actually uses that we form when he's just talking of himself. In Paul's letters, it's, Paul often uses it, and it's, it's very difficult to uh, know, in Paul's case, whether he's just using it like the royal we, or whether he's including Timothy and Titus or not. So Paul uses it a lot, but this is the only place where Jesus uses it, and it's an interesting question to know um, exactly who he means. Um, probably I'll, um, I'll go for um, the one that's saying Jesus and, and his men. He's bringing in his men to at this stage as kind of um, his, his representatives who will carry on his teaching. So what we know we speak about. So notice we have two words for speak. There's lego and then there's lalo. So lego basically corresponds to say and lalo uh, to speak. And heurakamen. So we met this form before in previous lessons. And this is this is the one that gave the the famous form eureka which is said by, who was it, uh, Archimedes, when he'd, he'd um, puzzled out the, the solution to a, a problem. He said, uh, Eureka, 
which means I have seen it. And here we see the form here, heoraka, but the additional bit here makes it plural, we have seen. We bear witness to kaiten marturian hemon u lambanete. And or but the testimony, the witness, our our witness, not you receive. You do not receive. You or you might say you refuse to receive, you are not receiving. Okay, coming down to this twelve. Eta epigea epon humin kai u pistuete pos ean epo humin ta epurania pistuete. If the epigea, so notice the two parts of this is epi meaning upon and gea meaning earth. The root form of this is ge. Um, but you, you might hear people using the word, this word, um, now they talk about Gaia, meaning, some people talk about Gaia, meaning the earth, and so that comes from this. Also we get words like geometry from this, where the G actually comes from this game. Uh, Apon, I have said to you, so this is you plural, he's not just talking about Nicodemus, but you plural, you Jews, you Jewish teachers, kai u pistuete, and you are not believing, you don't believe, we, in English we might add me, pos, how, and if I say to you, so this is actually a, a subjunctive form, a po, you can see that on the um, Zondervan Biblical Greek sheet, humin ta epurania. So this again is epi, but it's been shortened, with the, it's been lost with the following verb. So ur, uranos, meaning heaven. So we had epigea the upon earth things, and here we have Epurania, the upon heaven things. Pistuete. So, notice here we had Pistuete, that's present, and this S here um, is the only difference between this one and this one, so the S tells us that it's future. Pistuete, you believe. Pistuete, you will believe. How will you believe? Although probably in translation we'd say, how can you believe? Or how will you be able to believe if I tell you about heavenly things? Kai vestitin udes anabebeken eis ton uranon e me Eme ho ek tu uranu katabas, ho huyos tu anthropu. And no one, ana bebo, so that's ana meaning up. And down here we have kata meaning down. So these are two forms of the same word meaning go, bas, and bebeken. So the repeated beb is characteristic of the um, perfect. No one has come, no one has gone up to heaven on Uranon, a may, if not, unless, or uh, in this case we just translate except, ha, the one, ek tu Uranu katabas the one who has come down from heaven, Hohuios to Anthropu, the son of man. So this is a very interesting expression, Hohuios to Anthropu. It's an expression that Jesus commonly uses it of himself. It's interesting that John 
and the other gospel writers never use it of Jesus in, in what they say, but they only ever put it in Jesus' mouth. So Jesus evidently used it of himself, but his disciples don't use it of him. It's a word that, a special word that he, a special phrase that he uses of himself. And it, it's actually a Hebrew and Aramaic expression. It just means man or person, a son of man, huios to anthropo. So word by word, it's just the son of man. But um, it's a common expression, still used in modern Hebrew, to just mean man or person. And also, interestingly, it was God's pet name for the prophet Ezekiel. But its full meaning, as far as Jesus is concerned, you'd have to look at Daniel 7.13, where it talks about the, the Son of Man at, at the end times. But um, at least in their first hearing, the hearers would, wouldn't have, have gone that far. Um, Mm, and they wouldn't have perhaps joined the dots until um, much later and they would have just taken this as just a fairly normal way of referring to himself or maybe they would have thought of Ezekiel so um, what's this man saying they might have said is he um, making some kind of reference to uh, Ezekiel it's true that when we look in the New Testament we find that Jesus um, has links back with so many things in the Old Testament, and here's perhaps a link back to um, Ezekiel. And um, when you uh, finally come to the full understanding of it, you see it's a link back to those important words in Daniel. So going on to verse 14, Kaikathos Moses Upsos in ton ofin en te ereme, eremo. So this is referring to Numbers 21, verse 8 and 9. And as, just as Moses, Hupsosen, he lifted up the snake in the desert. That's the time when Moses put up the bronze serpent or snake for the people to look at and be healed from their snake bites. Um, so we'll uh, carry on with the rest of verse 14 in a minute just need to change over my paper sheets here so we come to the second part of verse 14 hutos upsothene de ton puyon to anthropu so we see the same verb again um, to be raised up hupsosen so this is the s indicating the simple characteristic of the simple past um, and the N ending meaning third person singular, Moses, he raised up. And here's the same uh, root word. And this th, th, th in Greek called theta is characteristic of passive, uh, characteristic letter in passive forms. And the Ni, again, you, you can find it on the um, little sheet of biblical Greek forms that we use so that's an in infinitive so this is a passive inf infinitive to be raised up and um, it's interesting that this evidently has a double meaning so it could mean raised up on the cross or it could mean raised up in glory and here's the day again as we met before it is necessary and uh, again it's followed by the accusative it is necessary for the Son of Man so it is necessary uh, for the Son of Man to be raised up coming to verse 15 in the pas hopistion en auto eche zoen eonion hina in order that everyone hopistion so this is a participle, the believing one. In auto eche zoin union. Now, because John doesn't otherwise use n with pistio, he normally uses ace, um, we should probably take the n 
as going with the auto. So saying that in order that everyone who believes in him might have uh, eternal life. Um, and in has quite a few different meanings um, in Bible Greek. Um, it can mean in, just like the, the um, a normal word in, but probably in this case it means more like agency. So perhaps the best translation would be because of him. And so this is a subjunctive again. He um, might have or he can have. Notice that um, the formal translations will translate things like he might have. Now, um, this is using might in an old sense in English of a subjunctive, but to me, subjunctive. But to me, that's an unfortunate translation because um, today we just use might in the sense of maybe. So I think it's, it's we shouldn't say uh, he might have life um, because people would understand that to mean he might, he might or he might not. But um, no, it, it's not used in the, the normal modern sense of might, but it's in the old-fashioned subjunctive sense in order that he might have life. So it would be better to translate it to something like so that he will will have, even so that he will have or, or can have or, or could could have. Um, but perhaps, you know, to make it clear that it, it's, it's a definite thing that he's talking about, so that he will have... Um, Zoin Ionion, so again the N indicates the object and uh, so we come to this expression that occurs quite a few times in John's Gospel Zoin Ionion, life eternal, the old translations said um, but it, it's perhaps not so much looking at the time factor which it could also be translated, incidentally, life of the age to come, the life of the age to come, which gives us a clue that it's it's talking more about the quality of the life. And in John's Gospel, this is a present possession of the believer. Zoe in Ionion, Zoe Ionios, eternal life. So now we come to this very famous verse, perhaps the most famous verse in the Bible, and some, some have said the most famous sentence in the world. Hutos gar egapesen hotheos ton kosmon. Thus, or like this, or so much. Gar for egapesen. So again, the S here indicates, is characteristic of the aorist, as it's technically called, or in English, we would just call it the simple past. And again, characteristically, verb and then subject. And then object, ton kosmon. Hoste ton huion ton manogene edoken. So the first interesting thing here to notice is the ABBA structure. So this is... Um, Where do we have? So we have um, verb, subject, object, and then we have object, verb, and the subject again is not stated. So there's the A, B, B, A. So this is known as an A, B, B, A structure, or technically it's called chiasmus. Uh, again, this is lost in translation, but chiasmus is quite common in the Bible, and it's interesting that it occurs here in this verse, this very famous verse. So we have verb object, and then object verb. Uh, so, 
uh, just coming back to this, the aorist. So some of the commentators say aorist, meaning which refers to a simple past, a single simple event in the past. Uh, so some say that is referring to the single great act of love that uh, of Jesus being sent and, and dying for us. But the aorist can also mean um, a whole lot of things, or kind of summed up in the one verb. But this edokin, which again is aorist, um, despite the fact that the K here, you know, so the K um, often indicates that it's a, um, a perfect, but not in this case, this verb's a little bit different. And you can, uh, you can see them if you look at the back page of our, our little biblical Greek sheet where the different forms of this verb are set out. The um, first one of it is didomi, didomi which is um, a slightly unusual form. Um, so it's, it's uh, uh, one of the uh, irregular verbs. Um, and so, yes, so this is aorist. So this is definitely referring to this, the single great act of giving, God gave. Um, oh, I'm just, sorry, jumping back up here again. God loved the world, and the commentators note that this is unparalleled in Jewish literature, the idea that God loves the whole world. Um, gave his only son. This is a reference back to Genesis chapter 22 verses 12 and 16 where Abraham is prepared to sacrifice his son Isaac. But there it is said Abraham did not withhold his son. But instead of did not withhold it's put into a single positive verb. He gave his son. This is the King James Version's only begotten son, uh, but it's well rendered by the NIV's one and only son, but um, only begotten, slightly old-fashioned English is um, um, putting this uh, monogene as begotten, is monogene, the one, only begotten. Monogene, that's where they get only begotten. Um, but the NIV takes it as one and only son. In a pas ho pistuon es auton, so here we have the characteristic pistuon es, me apaleta aleke zoeneonion. Again, we have this characteristic of John as well. The negative and then the positive. Me apaletai will not perish, but have eternal life. Characteristic of John to um, state something in the negative and then restate it as the positive, or vice versa. Yeah, a few more comments that um, I want to make here. Um, first, jumping back to the beginning of the verse again. So it, it's characteristically trans, um, quoted, uh, translated and quoted as for God so loved the world. But um, it's um, quite unusual for us to use for like that. I wouldn't say I won't be at work tomorrow for I am sick. I just say I won't be at work tomorrow, I'm sick. Or I won't be at work tomorrow because I'm sick. So um, if we, we could just if we want to put this into plain normal English, let's just say God loved the world so much. And I think it's important to put it into plain normal English because this is an important message for the world. Let's not leave it stuck in kind of um, hyper formal old fashioned English for God so loved the world. Let's put it into good plain modern English. God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son. And world, of course, means people of the world, as the Good News Bible and other versions say. Now just a word about this pistuane ace, 
Um, as, as I mentioned, this is John's characteristic way of referring to saving faith. So it's characteristically translated, everyone who believes in him. But again, if, if we are aiming to put this into plain modern English, which I think is very important, we have to think about, how, well, how do we use the expression believe in in English? And often we use it like this, we say, despite your past failures, Fred, I believe in you still. I still think you can do it. So that's not quite the type of context that we want here. Despite your past failures, I believe in you still. Now it's quite different to that. But we also say, um, do you believe in the tooth fairy? Meaning, do you believe that it exists? So neither of those is really what we want here. So I would advocate a translation like, um, well, what it's really meaning is give your allegiance to someone. That's a little bit of an old-fashioned term, I suppose, but I think it's it's getting it like in the days of the knights of old, and we you swore allegiance to the king. So, but but in, in perhaps in simple or modern English, we can say uh, join up or accept his leadership or submit to his leadership. I think actually that personally, I would prefer that. Now, some people might object and say, hey, you've changed those words quite a bit. Believe in, pistiron ace, you've changed it to in English words that are entirely different. What are you doing? Well, what I'm doing is I'm trying to get what this, these Greek words mean and put them into the plain, normal English equivalent. And that's the best that I can come up with. Well, if you come up with something else, please let me know. I'd be interested to hear, but that's the best that, that I can come up with. Um, submit to his leadership. Everyone who submits to his leadership will not apoletai. So apoletai could mean be lost, or it could mean to die or to suffer destruction. So the three main meanings be lost, like you're wandering lost, or die, like physical death, or suffer destruction in terms of um, the um, what some people call a, 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 a death in, in the spirit, a, 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 a spiritual death, and I think that's probably the main meaning of it here. Um, of course, we're, we're, we will all die physically unless Jesus returns before the time, but otherwise we all die physically. But he's not talking about physical death here. He's talking about being lost and in, in, in spiritual death but instead have eternal life, the life of the new age. Um, and we met this um, phrase before at the beginning of verse 15, and we talked about it. So isn't this a wonderful verse? And um, I would um, suggest to anyone that it's well worth learning this in Greek and um, uh, remembering it in Greek because Every translation is is um, an approximation. Every translation is an approximation. So it's good if you study it in Greek, you have the opportunity to learn it in Greek and let the Greek words flow through your mind and and learn it in the exact Greek. Although, of course, uh, Jesus would have spoken these words in Hebrew or, or Aramaic, yet his John's um, best representation of those words in the Greek that he wrote 2,000 years ago. Now I just want to mention in preparing these, um, particularly these last three Greek lessons, uh, lesson 24, 25 and 26, I've referred to several different commentaries, but this uh, I think is the most valuable one. It's part of the um, International Critical Commentary series, and it's written by a Catholic scholar named John F. McHugh who actually died recently, unfortunately, died before he could complete his commentary on John's Gospel. So as you can see, this is a fairly uh, thick tome, and it only covers um, John chapter 1 to 4. But to me, the international critical commentaries are the gold standard of commentaries. Other commentaries have their own particular interests, um, but these ones can't be beaten for depth of scholarship, and um, breadth of understanding and um, for the con detailed consideration of the Greek and, and Hebrew words 
that are involved. So don't be put off by this word critical because the Bible can withstand critical examination and um, it shines all the brighter for it. And exegetical, so exegesis, um, again, it, it is a Greek word. It refers to uh, extracting the meaning. So I highly recommend this commentary. It is a little bit technical, but if you want to get the best, the gold standard um, explanation of, of what the, um, the Bible is really talking about, these are the commentaries that you want, the International Critical Commentary Series, and in particular, this one on uh, John chapter 1, um, to four.